Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, church. Happy Sunday. Good morning. For everyone watching, good morning. Thank you for joining us here at Grace Baptist Church in Bristol, Connecticut. We hope you're having a wonderful morning, even though we're all tired from the clock changes. We just have a few announcements. I just want to talk to you about some things that are coming up actually during the week and next weekend. During the week, ladies, we still have our Ladies Women's Ministry uh, DVD series going on. We have a few more weeks. It's on Tuesday night at 7 o'clock till 8.15. We're watching a DVD series so you can jump in any week you can make it. So come join us. It's a great time for the ladies to get together in fellowship and study God's Word. Men, we didn't forget about you. Next Saturday at 7.30 in the morning, the men gather on the third Sunday of, Saturday of every month for men's breakfast. And the breakfast is at Parkside Cafe. So guys, come. It's a great time to fellowship. And there's a men's devotion, a few minute men's devotion that morning. And so bring a guy friend, bring a relative. It's a great time for the guys to get together once a month. And then next Sunday, we have our night of prayer. Also on the third Sunday of every month, we do our one hour of prayer. And we meet here in the sanctuary at six o'clock at night, from so six to seven. And we just play tons of awesome worship music. And we gather in prayer. We just either silently pray if you'd like to pray out loud. Just we join together as a congregation and as a, as a group of Christians just to call on the Lord for whatever is on our hearts. So that is next Sunday night. We hope you can join us for that. And there's one more new thing I wanted to make you aware of starting next Sunday, just to give you an advance notice of it. We've added something new to our envelope in our collection boxes. If you don't have envelopes and you'd like some, please see Steve Reed. We have plenty of boxes of envelopes for the whole year of giving, and we can assign you a box um, anytime. So just get in touch with Steve or at the church office. But in the box of envelopes, this year we're doing something new to support our Grace Community Food Pantry. We've added an envelope for giving. You'll see the blue envelopes in there, and they are going to come out quarterly. So next Sunday will be our first collection for the pantry. And for anyone that's not familiar with our pantry, we have our Grace Community Food Pantry on Saturdays from 10 to 12. And it's just been an unbelievable blessing for us as a church and for our community. We are the largest food pantry in the city of Bristol. Just to give you an idea, last year in 2023, we served food to over 13,000 people. And we've served, yeah, it's awesome what God is doing. And we've served enough, we've served meals to those people for over 118,000 400 meals. So that's how much food that we're giving out and distributing at our pantry. So we need help. We need help with funding every time, every year, this time of year, we look for funding. The pantry is a separate business and a separate part of the church. Your tithes and offerings and your giving and the general operating fund, none of that money comes towards the pantry. So we are totally independently funded. So we're always looking for ways to get funding, and we, we thought this would be a great way for you to give if you're interested in giving to the pantry. Also, you'll see in front of you, there's some QR codes. You can just click on that QR code in the seats, and you can it brings you to the giving page. You can just pick the food pantry and give that way. And also, if you go online to our website, you can connect there and give on our website also if you're interested in helping. The pantry goes through a minimum $15,000 a year food at a minimum, you know, we're always growing and we're buying and purchasing more, so there is a need um, to keep supporting the food pantry, so we'll help, you know, hope that you'll help us in keeping the pantry going. Okay, thank you. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for this day, Lord, we thank you that we can gather as your believers, Lord, and just worship you and praise you and glorify you, Lord. We know that you provide, Lord, your provision of God. And we call out to you now to provide for us, Lord, as we serve our community in the ways that you want us to. We, we thank you, Lord, that you use us, that you use us as a church in this city that cares for people and loves people and wants to bring people hope in this city, Lord. We ask that your presence be here with us today as we celebrate you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> so as um, Donna gets to her spot, why don't we all stand up and um, turn to the person 
but that's around you and just say good morning to them as we get ready for worship. <laughs> everybody, right? <laughs> I'd like to welcome Tony right here. He's going to play bass this morning. We have a little bit of a smaller setup today, but that means you guys had to sing three times loud. <laughs> Let's give God praise this morning. Ready?
you that so many times we have been able to call upon you. Lord, in that very day, the first moment that we called upon you and we accepted the gift of salvation, the free gift of your salvation, we thank you, Lord. Lord, you didn't turn away from us. You didn't shun us. Lord, we repented and you accepted and you have been loving us. Lord, I would just ask this morning that you continue to do that work in all of our hearts. Lord, I think sometimes we get so, we just get so caught up in the things of the world that we forget you are over, of, over this world. You are not of this world. But Lord, you have our lives in your hands. You are sovereign. You are mighty. You are king. You are Lord of lords and king of kings. So Father, this morning I would just ask that you that you give us a full indwelling, an overflowing of your Holy Spirit. And as we hear the word, that your word penetrates our hearts. Our ears are made to hear you. Our eyes are able to see you in all of your glory. We love you, Lord. We thank you and we praise you. And Jesus, in your name we pray. Amen. 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 Everybody can be seated. Welcome. Everybody's doing pretty good this morning. I think I saw most of you when you came in. They all look pretty good. Excited, you know, excited to be here. The the boys were excited. I mean, they came in. I mean, there was just like toys dumping. We got good toys in there. That's awesome. I mean, we want that. I mean, I know I know a couple of us were like, ooh, what those trucks over there too. So right. And uh, we have a we have a great Sunday school. We'll be dismissing a little bit later. Not yet. Not yet. I saw some preparations going on downstairs too. So. Uh, but welcome to Grace Baptist. I'm Pastor Tom Heron. If this is your first time here or your first time tuning in, it is wonderful to have you with us. And if this is your manyth time here, it's wonderful to see everybody and uh, to be together to worship. And uh, as uh, Tammy said, we always, always like to see a new member and uh, on our worship team joining us. And we like the old members too. Not that you're old, but you know, Tammy, and Joe, and, uh, and Donna and coming up here and. Uh, can I say what your, your wife said? If she, it's a new way to see you up here, flying this way? Yeah, it's a little bit different than the... A little bit different. A little bit different than the, uh, than the rock and roller. Kind of thing. <laughs> right, right. But praise God. You know, Tony's been up here, and uh, we got uh, Mike and Brenda up there in the uh, in the sound booth, and we have John. John's way back there. He's running the camera for us. So a lot of people doing a lot of things. And it uh, takes a lot of things to keep the service going. If it's something you'd be interested in, you know, come and see, say, hey, I want to get involved. If you if you love kids, if you love greeting, if you love uh, if you love finance, right, Steve? We need yeah. finance people. Yes. We, if you like fixing things, we can always use that. There's a lot of ways to get involved. And if you have a heart for serving outside the four walls, we can take care of that, too. So we just love to, uh, you know, if there's something to say, hey, I think I might be interested in this, come on out. So, uh, man, check in with me. Call the church office during the week. And, uh. We'll plug you right in. We, uh, we certainly do. And uh, we had a great time this morning in Adult Sunday School. We're working through a uh, second week of Francis Chan's Crazy Love. There, we had some good, uh, it's a really good discussion and uh, some good sharing of some things going on. So if that's something you're interested in, make sure you check us out. Sunday mornings, 9 o'clock, we meet downstairs. It was really early today, but everybody came in pretty alive. <laughs> so that was good. But what we're going to do is, uh, we have another song in a moment, but I'm going to have uh, Sue and Bob, our ushers, come on up. And we're going to take up our offertory. And we're just so blessed here at Grace that we, uh, you know, that we, we've been faithful. We've had such faithful givers, people who give. I talk of our, our time and our talent and also of treasure. And, uh, you know, we always look to say, we, you know, this is a chance to give back to God what is, what is rightfully his. And, uh. We, uh, we appreciate that as we give our tithes and our offerings, you know, the tenth of what we have, and then you know, we've asked over the years to continue to be sacrificial, and then we've really, uh, we're doing some really good things, and it's always to be on the mission of God, and to, you know, be a beacon in our community, not only just be a building, but to be a beacon, and then, you know what, we've been blessed to be able to do that, and we're going to continue to move forward and serve God in all the way he calls us and to be good stewards of what he has given us here. And, uh, and that just encourages us to be cheerful givers and to be good stewards of what he's given us. So let's pray. 
Lord, we thank you that we can, we do, we are able to give back to you, Lord. We're able to give back our tithes and our offerings to you. And Lord, I would just ask that you put a cheerfulness in our heart because as we give, Lord, we'll, we'll just, we'll be able to just, you know, connect even more so with you. You love us no matter what, Lord. And Lord, as we give cheerfully, we ask that you do far greater things with what we have, Lord. It's it, it's just uh, so we're so grateful that we can be here and be in this position this morning, Lord, to worship you, to study your word, to praise you, to come together as, as friends, friends brought together in the power of the Holy Spirit by you. So, Lord, I would ask that you take our offering. And, Lord, as we've always asked, that you do far greater things with it than we can even imagine. Lord, we thank you for this time. We love you, Lord, and we praise you. Jesus, in your name we pray. Amen. Amen.
They sound pretty excited, don't they, going down? They'll be up later with some sort of crap that they'll be making. And really what we try to do is we're gearing them up for uh, for Easter and you know, trying to teach them and, and, of course, to have fun and, uh, and really give them a foundation. And uh, we really work it along with, you know, what's, what we're preaching on up here, although we're not really sending the kids downstairs to learn about the prophet Amos today. That might be a bit much for them, but they're... They're starting their uh, they're starting their journey of Easter. We'll be doing that over. Uh, you know, we have uh, a Good Friday service coming up, and we also have on the twenty fourth. That is traditionally known as Palm Sunday. We all, in our service we're going to be doing baptisms. I know we have a couple people lined up for baptism, and a couple more I think who are uh, who are expressing uh, their interest. So if that is something that the Lord is putting on your heart. That the Holy Spirit is moving you into doing. He said, I need to know more. You know, I've accepted Jesus Christ, and I've never been baptized as an adult of your own volition. Um, come and see me. Come and talk to me, and uh, we'll talk about your testimony. We'll talk about it. Baptism is, and then we're going to be doing that. We'll open up right back here. We've never been here. We have the baptismal tank, and we will do that. So, and that will be... Uh, Sunday the 24th, and then of course we have our Good Friday service at 6 o'clock on that Friday night, and Easter Sunday we will uh, we'll be here. And then I'm excited too, because after um, after Easter we're going to be starting a series um, called Yes It Happened, and that's about the miracles that Jesus did, so that's going to be a, that always gets us going, we start to see the power and the might of Jesus, and we look at, we look at why he was performing these miracles, and as I've always been saying, that the greatest miracle Raise your hand. Right there. You know, you're, you're one of the greatest miracles that there ever was. And the fact that Jesus rose from the dead. And he took us out of that dead and brought us to life. So we have a great miracle. But we just, as you know, we wrapped up our series in Jude. And that was a wild ride. It's some a couple weeks, I think. But it was good. It's so important. It's so critical that we be, we be focused. We be focused on proper doctrine, proper teaching, knowing the Lord, understanding our faith, having a good foundation, and also as we're challenged by everything coming at us in the world, we need to be ready. And today's sermon, we're just taking a one-week little journey into uh, one of the Old Testament prophets. His name is Amos. You may or may not have heard of him. He is really not. He is a fiery Old Testament prophet who had a job to do. And uh, he delivered a message but we're, this sermon is called Preparation Time. And I think it's, well, I like the graphic. We have the clocks because they're all looking up there now saying, oh, I wish it was an hour. I had an extra hour of sleep. But you know what? Amos had the message. The day is going to come. The day is going to come. Be prepared. And we want to look at that. So we are going to actually, what I'm going to do is read Amos 4, 6 through 13. It will be up on the screen. And if you have your Bibles or... Um, Follow along on your uh, on your phones or iPad. It'll be Amos four six through thirteen. But I gave you cleanness of teeth in all your cities, and lack of bread in all your places. Yet you have not returned to me, declares the Lord. Furthermore, I withheld the rain from you, while there were still three months until harvest. Then I would send rain on one city, and on another city I would not send rain. One part would be rained on, while the part not rained on would dry up. So two or three cities would stagger to another city to drink water, but would not be satisfied. Yet you have not returned to me, declares the Lord. I smote you with scorching wind and mildew, and the caterpillar was devouring your many gardens and vineyards, fig trees and olive trees. Yet you have not returned to me, declares the Lord. I send a plague among you after the manner of Egypt. I slew your young men by the sword, along with your captured horses, and I made the stench of your camp rise up in your nostrils. Yet you have not returned to me, declares the Lord. I overthrew you as God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah, and you were like a firebrand snatched from a blaze. Yet you have not returned to me, declares the Lord. Therefore, thus I will do to you, O Israel, because I will do this to you. Prepare to meet your God, O Israel. For behold, he who forms mountains and creates the wind and declares to man what his thoughts, what are his thoughts, he who makes dawn into darkness 
and treads on the high places of the earth. The Lord God of hosts is his name. That is God's word for us, God's people. Let's pray. Lord, as we read that, I, maybe our, our hearts are just, we, we stop for a moment and we say, what is this, Lord? Lord, I don't like to hear this. But Lord, your truth is real. Your truth must be dealt with. Lord, the truth is that you love us. You give us so many opportunities to turn to you, Lord. Yet at times we fail. Lord, we were living one way, now we're living this way. Lord, are we truly all in for you? And that's what you want for us. Lord, you are God, you are holy, you are over everything. Yet you desire a relationship with us. So Lord, let us, as we break down this scripture, as we unpack this this morning, let it touch our hearts. Let us be, Lord, made uncomfortable. Holy Spirit, convict us, touch our hearts. You know, we understand, God, your word is, is a double-edged sword. It pierces. Let it pierce the, the hardness, the dark parts sometimes that we don't want to give to you. And let us be open and understand that you do love us. You have a great plan for us. You are God. We are your creation. You love us dearly. But Lord, put in our hearts that there is a decision to be made. We love you, Lord, and we praise you in Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. Hard words from Amos. And we'll look in a moment at you know, Amos' call, a little bit of who he was. We'll look at kind of what was going on around. But I don't know if any of you have um, ever coached youth sports. No? Yeah. You're, you're all right. You've got through it. Okay. Because <laughs> it can be challenging. For a number of years, um, I coached AAU girls basketball for the Connecticut Fire. And I coached a number of age groups, 14, 15, 16. And it was quite challenging. And I remember I had this team. It was actually my first year, and they were, they were a 14-year-old team. They were, they were a great bunch of kids. The parents were. <laughs> no, the parents were great. But I can remember a, a game. We were up in Massachusetts somewhere playing. And I and I was trying to put a plan into place. You know, I, I wasn't quite as like a Danny Hurley wild like that, but I did pace a lot back and forth. And I'd wander out of the coach's box. And even I started preaching and uh, moving into pastoring not long after coaching basketball. And it was Donna who used to have to say to me, uh, you're not you're not coaching basketball anymore because I had a real bad habit of, of walking the sidelines. But you know, one of my the game plan would always be, as you, you set up, I wanted to see I wanted to see 12 to 15 passes before any shots went up. I wanted to work everybody in. The goal of the AAU was to get them all, get them all better from where they were. And, all the, and we had 11 girls and they all played. A certain amount of minutes, and so my thing was always you're only as you're only as good as really the the least experienced player or the one who has not a fully developed skill set. So that was always important. So I remember going out there and they start making passes, and all of a sudden I'm watching. And great, they were my two best players, and they're playing a little back and forth game by themselves, they're passing, passing, running, trying to get open, and they're not passing anybody else. And I'm looking. Time out. You know, threatening, I'm going to bench you if you do that again. All right, you're going to be sitting on the bench, you're done. And now go back out there, I don't know what's going on, but here's your warrant. And they go out and they they keep, start off and then they start doing it again. And all of a sudden, I'm look, I look down and there's one of the dads. He's directing them what to do. I said, time out, go three minutes and sit on the bench, you're done. That went well with the parents. But, you know, it, it made the point. But I gave them the warning, but they went back and did it. And that's our, that's our nature. And they had, they had something distracting them because they had, a, they had a father. They're trying to be good or they're trying to score points. I don't know. But, you know, they were believing that nothing is going to happen if we continue to just act this way on the court. And I sat them down and I said, you know, the whole first rest of the half is if you can go in, you're going to play right. And they were mad and the team was coming together. We eventually played really well. It was our best tournament. And, and the girls did 
It's like, well, but they didn't believe what I had told them until I benched them. Then they went back out, they never did it again. Dad and I had a little discussion. And uh, they learned. But that's sometimes human nature. But sometimes it takes us time and time and time again. You know, what do we think about what we believe? Sometimes we're, we're so quick to believe what we see and hear in the wrong places. I know there's probably some of you this morning who turned on a news channel. Woo! And you believe what you hear in the news. Or you pick up a newspaper. Woo! You know, we're quick to believe, we're quick to believe some of that. We're sometimes even quick to believe, you know, what we see when it's it's deceiving. And sometimes we're we're quick to, to jump in what we're called to do, but without thinking it through, and we jump into all the wrong places, don't we? Is anybody a little impetuous to say, yeah, I'm, oh that sounds great. I'll do that. And, you know, you jump. And it's not good. It doesn't help you. But we're quick to believe so many things of the world. Because if we're looking through the we're looking through a worldly lens as opposed to a biblical lens. Because we're quick to believe what we see in the world, what we hear in the world, what we read in the world. But yet we're not so quick when it comes to understanding the word of God, what God has said, how God has acted. Do we believe what we read and hear from God's word? Yeah, I thought I'd like it. And if you're in God's word, if you're not in God's word, how can you possibly have an opportunity? Do we believe what we see in the actions of God? Both historically and in the present. Do we believe that God is moving in life? Again, when we look at the word, do we understand that this Old Testament, what I read this morning, it talks about seven wonderful things that happened to the nation of Israel. Do we believe that is true? Do we believe God has acted in history, always for the best interest of his people, but to get his message across? Do we believe in acting on what God calls us to do? There's so many times God is, is leading us in a direction. He's pushing us. He's pulling us. He's maybe tapping with a two-by-four in the back of our head. And we say, yeah, oh, Lord, I, you know, I'm not ready to do that. Let me sit and pray about it more. And it's been crystal clear. You see, we're sometimes struggling in what we believe. We'll believe if we look through our worldly lenses, yet we'll hesitate when it comes to looking through a biblical lens. And this is exactly what has happened to the nation of Israel here. And again, I'll challenge, we have to be focused on what we believe, we have to believe in God's words, God's actions, God's history, his call on us individually to be able to operate corporately. One of the things that, that I study a lot is church revitalization and looking at that. And really, it, sometimes it comes down to a church isn't going to grow, a church isn't going to be revitalized unless there's a focus on God's word, discipleship, and prayer. Because we start that individually, because then we start to believe more in what God is calling us to do, and then the church grows and is revitalized. And here's the challenge this morning, how this is going to tie in to all of these bad things that we see in Amos. With proper belief, people can meet the Lord as their Savior and not just as their judge. What does that have to do with belief? You're saying, oh, it has a lot to do with belief. Because if our belief is not growing to see how much God wants from us, we're only going to say, well, he's just the judge. He's not my Savior. And I want each one of us to know, walk out of here confident today, and be building that, that Jesus is my Savior. Not a Savior, not the Savior, not somebody else's Savior, but my Savior. And we have to grow in our belief of that. So as we look at this, what I read to you, and I'm, I'm going to break it down a little bit more, but a little bit of historical context that's taking place around, around Amos. Amos was called to prophesy into the northern section of Israel. We're going to look at his call, but what was going on in this northern section of Israel, and it was about the mid-700 B.C., 
you know, prior to uh, prior to Jesus. But it was a great time of prosperity in the lives of God's people. You know, they were thriving. The economy was doing pretty good. People were living okay. They were living well. Things seemed really good. So the problem wasn't what was going on in the world. It was what was going on in their personal lives. Because when everything was going good around them, God's people were in a great area of spiritual apathy and moral decay. You know, ever been there? Everything's good. Eh, I don't need you guys. I can kind of do what I want right now. Maybe we've done that. But spiritual apathy, I'm not worried about my faith. I'm not really worried about God's word. I'm not really worried about the fact that I can commune and pray with God. And then the moral decay, because as soon as we enter into that apathetic state, as soon as we say, I'm not apathetic. I don't really care what anybody else does. I know that I'm good with God. Well, that's spiritual apathy, folks. We, we don't care. It's a lack of caring. Because when we start not caring about what goes on around us, we'll start not caring what goes on with us. And then that leads to moral decay. Apathy toward our faith and growing our faith and plugging in to it leads to a gravitation towards sin, toward idolatry. And that's dangerous because there are consequences for that. So really, it was, the problem was not what was happening around the people that Amos had to address, but rather what was not taking place in the hearts of people. You see, God isn't looking always for you know, us to be earning our way, to be showing how good we are. He wants what's in our hearts to be focused on Him, to be focused on our faith, and then what's going on inside, there's a natural outpouring to how we're acting in the world. Because God had a sense of urgency. He had been warning his people. I just read to you seven different bad things that happened. And we'll get a little more detail in those. But God was acting in a sense of urgency. And even if the people were not focused, even if they were apathetic. I don't care. Even if they were in moral decay, well, it's kind of fun. I think I'll keep doing that. You know, in many ways, our world is so prosperous. The church in America is incredibly prosperous in many ways. We woke up in homes today. We got in our car. We drove to church. Oh, before we came, we flipped on the news. Maybe we, uh, we poured some coffee in our coffee pot. We are incredibly prosperous. We're incredibly blessed. Maybe you went to Dunkin', maybe you went to Starbucks. I think God, you can do that. <laughs> See, we are very prosperous. But what God is getting at is you are my people. You've made a you, you said you've made a decision to follow me. I want all your hearts. And we look at this call of Amos. Amos, this fiery prophet. He looks really angry. He just seems so angry. We probably wouldn't like him if he came walking in. You know, he'd probably be yelling at people and stuff. And he said, I got a message from God. Thus saith the Lord. But he was called to do that. And what we know about Amos, we don't know a ton about him. But we do know, as he says in, uh, in Amos 7.14, it says, Then Amos replied to Amaziah, I am not a prophet, nor am I the son of a prophet, for I am a herdsman and a grower of sycamore figs. Prophets were called from an early age to this role. Oftentimes it was a family thing to be a prophet. You're called by God. You know you're brought up to serve the Lord. What we find out is about Amos was very prosperous. Amos was a wealthy herdsman, and we see the sycamore figs. He was a farmer. Amos had wealth and means. This is not always who God called. God has cultivated his prophets from a young age. But this is so urgent because I need somebody who can go out into the world to grab their attention, to speak my word, and to warn people. And what was the warning? Prepare to meet your maker. See, so we see that God is acting in a sense of urgency. I need you, Amos. I need you now. Leave everything. Let's go. This is an important message for the world to hear. Because people were about to meet the judge. <laughs> 
but they didn't understand that he can also be the Savior, their Savior. And that was critical. Because as we looked at those verses, as I read verses 6 through 11, and a lack of bread in all your places. That's verse 6. That means there's a great famine. So God brought a great famine upon his people. That'd wake them up, right? Right? Nothing to eat. God, I need you. Yet you have not returned to me. So then God went and brought drought. In verse 7, we're seeing the drought. But God goes a step further in the drought. It's like, you know, okay, we're here in Bristol. It's raining all the time. But like, it, it, the way God was doing this, if we went to Terryville or we went to Southington, there wasn't, there wasn't any rain. See, God was showing, look, I'll have it rain in one place, so you'll go over there to get the water. You go back to your place, you're still suffering. But then I'll make it rain over there when I want to. So God was showing people, I'm going to bring this drought and look at what I can do. Yet as we see, you have not returned to me, declares the Lord. So you have a family of drought people. I don't care. I'm apathetic. I'll do my own thing. Then it continues in, in verse 9. I smote you with scorching wind and mildew. Now don't get worried. I know it's gonna be there's like 40 mile hour wind gusts coming tomorrow. It's just coincidence, I think, that you know, I didn't change the sermon because I saw the weather forecast. You no, know, but, but God is so powerful, he's saying, no, I'm going to bring this mildew and wind. Mold and wind? What is that? We have no problem in our basements. You know, but God is saying, look at what I'm going to do. I made famine. I took away the water. Now I'm going to give you, I'm going to give you moldy water. And then he combined it, he said, and the caterpillar was devouring He's talking about, he's bringing back a good old fashioned plague of the locusts. Guess what? You have not returned to me. He did that. This wasn't he was going to do it. This is the point of where he was doing it. Then in verse 10, I sent a plague among you. Do you remember the old story in Exodus? Maybe you do, maybe you don't. But remember what happened when the Egyptians didn't want to let God's people go. The plague, the plagues came. We see plagues of boils. We see all kinds of things, skin falling off. We don't exactly know what the plague is, but it's usually bad. Bubonic plague, it could have been anything. And then along with that, he slew their men. Time and time again, God has said, you know, I'm going I'm to send these hordes of armies against you. Yep. Killed many men. The ones who didn't suffer from the plague and had boils, they got killed by a by the attacking army. Yet you're kind of seeing a pattern here. Yet you have not returned to me, declares the Lord. And finally, in verse 11. But this, this is real. This is happening. This is history. I overthrew you as God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. Do you remember how God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah? It was bad. Fire from heaven, smote them, wiped them out, blew them up. Not like any, any little bomb going off. This was a huge blast that blew everything up, killed everybody, except those who God determined would save. And you were snatched like a firebrand from a blaze. And yet, people didn't return. And we're looking at this and saying, I don't, I don't really like this. You know, but before this happened, you know what God did? This wasn't God flying off the handle. Now, we all fly off the handle. Right? Some of us do fly off the handle occasionally. God just didn't fly off the handle and say, I'm taking you all out. I'm just doing all these things. He had given three warnings. He had warned people three times. In the book of Leviticus, in Deuteronomy and in 1 Kings. This wasn't fresh news to the people. This wasn't newsflash. Here's what happened. This was, I told you I was going to do it three times and you failed to listen to me. 
God has been very patient. I mean, this is terrible. Isn't God terrible? I mean, how can you do this? This is so unfair, God. No, no, I, I need to get your attention. God needs and wants our attention so that we turn to him. God needs and wants our attention so we bring him glory. We can look at this. And I talk to people and say, this is terrible. God, the God of the Old Testament, that's not the God I, you know, that I believe in. I believe in the God of the New Testament who loves me unless we do anything I want. That's, there's no two gods. There's one God. But what we see, you know, this is a great tie into the, to the sermon that we, we just completed when we look in Jude 3. Remember what it said? And then we have to push through and understand that, you know, God is calling us as we fight for proper doctrine, as we fight for our faith, as we grow in our faith. He said, I want you to contend. He says, contend for your faith. Beloved. Remember that? Beloved, I love you. While I was making every effort to write to you about our common salvation, I felt the necessity to write to you appealing that you contend earnestly for the faith, which was once all handed down to the saints. If God didn't love us, he wouldn't be encouraging us to turn back to him. Contending. Contending is fighting. And I'll challenge, if we are called to contend for the faith, is God not able to contend for his glory? We're called, you and I are called, we can contend for the faith. Are we, should we not be surprised when God says, I'm going to contend for my glory. I am the creator. I want your attention because I love you. Because I don't want you to spend eternity away from me in hell. So I'm going to contend for your life, which is his glory. You see, I believe as we look at this book of Amos, we can say, no, this isn't anything I need to understand. I'm good. I go to church on Sundays. I come to some of the stuff. I pray occasionally. But maybe God said, you're not all in. I want you all in for my glory. I want you to shine it out. I want you to know. I think that there's a challenge here. I think there's a challenge here. God is calling someone saying, you've been in, you've been like partially in, you've been kind of lukewarm. You haven't got all the way in. Some of you might know what happens when you're lukewarm. What's God do? Spits, Spits you out of his mouth. <coughs> if we are called to contend for the faith, yes, I will contend for my faith. God is going to contend for his glory. And in contending for his glory, God has set up, he's going to fight for you. He sent his son to die for us. His son rose, and he lives in us. You see, this is God's love. See, this is angry. God didn't fly off the handle. And I think that each one of us, we're probably, sometimes we're in a spot where we're not fully in. We're not living fully for all that God wants from us. I believe the church is called to be an army, an army of believers. I believe the church has it fully stepped all the way in to its call. Doesn't make us bad people. It means there's so much more we can do, isn't there? Because what the, the people at this time were living under in the Old Testament, you know, we've often talked about God as a covenantal God. God has made covenants. We had the, the Adamic Covenant, we have the Abrahamic Covenant, we have the Noahic Covenant, we have the Mosaic Covenant, we have the Davidic Covenant, we have the New Covenant. And these covenants a lot of times were what are known as suzerain vassal covenants. And that's a, that's a very old term, and but the people would understand that a suzerain vassal covenant was one where the king said, if you don't do this and act this way, I'm going to do this. And that's the covenant which the people lived under at that time. And there were some rules that went about with those type of covenants. It's a conditional covenant, very one-sided, king says. The king says, obey it, or else. Oh, by the way, it's made by me, but what I want all of you to do is I want you to always remind yourself of it. I want my covenant to be read out loud quite often. And I'm going to continually remind you of a list of the consequences if you don't participate in this covenant. And I think when we look into the book of Leviticus, Leviticus 11.45, which is up on the screen behind me, it's a, it's a favorite scripture that we have. 
For I am the Lord who brought you up from the land of Egypt to be your God. Thus you shall be holy. For I am holy. And that's really the suzerain vassal covenant. Do it or else. Again, that's what God's saying. He's not giving you these warnings, do it or else. But now we are living, we've moved into what's known as the new covenant. Ah, I like the new covenant. I can do whatever I want, right? No. You should be. If, you, if you're living in the new covenant, you're not doing whatever you want. You're doing what God calls you to do and you're enjoying that. And that's really called a royal covenant. And it's a covenant made that is, it's not, it's not conditional, but it's requiring of a decision. It's requiring. Well, the king says, I've come for you. You will live. You will be. You have everything you need. You have eternity. I've done it all. Just make that decision to follow me. You see, the problem is we have this suzerain vassal covenant. We don't live under that covenant. We live under the royal covenant, the new covenant, where Jesus says, I've done everything for you. And I think this is what the problem sometimes happens. We're living under this belief that I have to do everything for God. See, God is trying to get our attention this morning. And we're looking at history. We're looking at Amos. See, God... Oh, yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Oh, yeah. All right, God, got our attention. Oh. Oh. God, you have our attention now. Okay. You know, but I, I think we're sometimes we're living in that suzerain vassal covenant where we're trying to work so hard to do the things that God calls us to do that we're missing out on all that God has done for us. You know, we're stuck. We need to move. And we're trying to do religion. We're trying to be religious people. Be good people. Do the right things. And we're not living in Christ. You see, if we're always trying to live in, and follow religion, we're not going to do it. But if we're living in Christ and the power that he's given us, you know, because if we're living in the old covenant, we're saying, I'm good enough. Or I'm not good enough. You see, when we're living in this new covenant that God wants our attention this morning, he's saying, you're not good enough. But Jesus said, I am good enough. And therefore, one day you'll come with me. And I want to challenge this morning. I don't know where you're sitting. I don't know if you're sitting in that area where you're saying, I'm trying to do good, I'm trying to do good, I'm trying to do good. I'm good enough. Or maybe you're on that opposite side. I'm just not good enough. You're beating yourself up. You say, God can't love me. I want to challenge you that the people of God can move from doing religion to living fully in Christ. I want us this morning to start taking the step. I want us this morning to hear, yet you have not returned to me, declares the Lord. And say, yes, Lord, I'm returned to you. You see, because as we look in these the verses 11 through 13, we start to see this great picture, really, of who God is. We've seen this God who is, who is calling for attention, but we see a graceful and merciful God. Listen to 11 through 13. I overthrew you as God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah, and you were like a firebrand snatched from a blaze. Yet you have not returned to me, declares the Lord. Therefore, thus I will do to you, O Israel, because I will do this to you. Prepare to meet your God, O Israel. For behold, he who forms mountains and creates the wind and declares to a man what is, are his thoughts, he who makes dawn into darkness and treads on the high places of the earth, the Lord God of hosts is his name. I said, you're going to meet me. I want you to meet me as Savior. I want you to know me as Creator. The nation of Israel were the chosen ones of God. Yet decisions were required on their part. Each 
one of us sitting here this morning is here for a reason, not by accident. We've all been chosen. The question is, we have to make the decision. And that's what it requires. Because when Jesus came in the New Covenant, went from just being the Jewish people to being the Gentiles. But it's a decision that's going to be evidenced by fruits. And a scripture that, when I say I struggle with, not because I don't believe it, I believe this absolutely. But is Matthew 7.21. And I struggle because it's true. It says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. If we're still living in the Old Testament, it's in that suzerain, vassal kind of thing, Rob, I have to be good enough, I'm not good enough. I have to be better, I have to do these things. I don't think we understand that Jesus is Lord. And what I'd like you to know this morning is that Jesus is Lord. But you have to understand that he's your Lord. He's your Savior. He's your King. You don't have to do anything else this morning to earn your way to heaven. But we need to start allowing ourselves to live in Christ. Move from the religion to being in Christ. And I believe that he is calling so many of us to step, to step into the fruits. He has fruits that he wants us to do. Not that we have to do it, but that we can do it. If you have truly made Jesus your Lord and Savior, stop trying to earn your way to heaven. If you have not made Jesus your Lord and Savior, Maybe you're lukewarm. Today would be that day. You know, we see the call in there. We look back, we see this mention of the firebrand. We saw that in June 23. We were snatched out of the fire. You and I were snatched out of the fire for a greater purpose. I don't know what that greater purpose is for each of us. But we can certainly be praying for each other, praying as a church. Say, so what is my greater purpose, Lord, in serving you? What is my greater purpose, Lord? You snatch me out of the fire. Lord, are you going to use me to snatch others out of the fire? Are you going to use me to bring glory? Lord, are you going to use me to be a great prayer intercessor? And I would even challenge, and I'm excited because as our church grows... And I see young men. I don't know how God is going to use those young men. I see many young men in this church. Is God calling young men, young ladies to be missionaries? To go, to be raised up, to serve, to move. You are a firebrand snatched out of the fire by the grace of God. He just might be using each of us to snatch somebody out of the fire. You know, we understand in verse 12, we will meet God as judge. But I don't want that to be our focus. I want to say, I'm going to meet God, my Savior. I'm going to meet God, my Savior. We are in the new covenant. And this is not some God going to be taken lightly. This is not some God to be apathetic, saying, oh, it's preparation time. When I get to it, I'll get to it. Because you know what? Just like we did last night, we Set the clock ahead one hour. There's going to come a day when God is going to say, I'm setting the clock ahead. Today's the day. Let us be ready. This is not some little God who we've created in our head. This is not the people of Israel, these mountaintop deities. They have these little gods. You know, we're all big. We have the little crystals. We have little fake gods. We have yoga gods. We have Buddha gods. This is not who God is here. This is not the God on the mountaintop. So we're going to go up and see him. 
This is the God who made the mountains, who will take out the mountains, but who loves you and I dearly and is saying, return to me now and prepare to meet me one day as your Savior. And oh, I love you and you'll spend eternity with me. You know, there's a lot there. You know, Billy Graham once said, he wrote in the book of The Journey, he said, we know that heaven is real because of God's promises. We know it. We like it. We love it. We also know that God has promised time and time again in here. He said, return to me. Prepare to meet your maker. Come and see me. Come and know me. Be salt and light. Live out in your fruits. I want to encourage you this morning. I want to encourage you to believe God's word. I'm telling you, you got to get in God's word. God's word is fun. God's word is exciting. And we have a good time studying God's word around here, don't we? Yes. Yeah, I get emails and texts from people say, hey, I was in God's word. I saw this today. Oh, praise God. That's awesome. Let's talk about that. I want you to believe God's word, so you've got to get in God's word. And then when you get in God's word, I want you to believe God's actions. Because God's actions are true, they're holy, and they're perfect. And I want you to start believing that it's time to act on God's will for your life. God has a will for each one of our lives. Let's seek it, let's find it, let's act on it, and let's bring him glory. Psalm 139, verses 1 through 6 says, O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up, you understand my thought from afar. You scrutinize my path and my lying down and are intimately acquainted with all my ways. Even before there is a word on my tongue, behold, O Lord, you know it all. You have enclosed me behind and before and laid your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is too high. I cannot attain to it. God knows everything about us. He loves us. He desires us. And he's seeking for us to bring him glory. You're sitting here this morning because God has a plan for each one of you. Let's pray. Lord, we love you, we thank you, and we praise you. We give you all the glory. You are holy, Lord. Lord, I believe that you are calling so many of us back to you. Lord, it may not even be that we're living in a, in a blatantly sinful area. Lord, we may have sin in our life, and you're calling us away from that. Lord, we may just be somewhat apathetic, and you're calling us away from that. Lord, let us not say, oh, well, or I don't care, or I have time. Lord, let us be turning to you now this morning to see your glory, to see, Lord, to see the fruits that you desire to produce through us. Lord, I understand that you love each one of us, but I also understand that you're requiring each one of us to make decisions. Lord, maybe it's the decision to follow you for the first time. Maybe it's the decision to renew where we drifted off. Lord, maybe it's a decision to move from some of those sinful areas into fully serving you, to being fully used by you for your glory. Lord, let us not be caught up in religion, but let us be caught up in your son Jesus and know that one day we will be caught up to heaven with him. We love you, Lord, and praise you. And Jesus, in your name we pray. Amen. Again, as we share this last song together, I have a request of I know it lends the lot, but will you play this? <laughs> I needed some tambourine. We ran out of hands. So. Okay. So, um, okay, we're going to sing the song speaking of meeting Jesus one day, and this song is all about that. We're going to clap our hands and get it going. Oh! Hey! Let's take that. Let's light. Okay, so let's put our hands together. Ready? Let's go. Yeah. 
Let me let me get the beat going. Okay, here we go. Okay. There we go.